good morning, everyone, and welcome back. Uh, really excited about this uh, this policy session uh, on developing a bioindustrial strategy for Alberta. As some of you have been involved uh, a couple of years ago. Bio Alberta coordinated a group to develop a bioindustrial framework, and the work stalled for uh, for a few reasons. Uh, but uh, we we've committed to reigniting the work, getting the uh, the group going, and with all the uh, the changes in energy transition and new technologies, uh, the clean fuel standard, which is uh, is about to change. We'll hear that. Uh, we'll hear more about that from Doug a little bit later. Um, it, it's a really uh, prime opportunity for us to get together again and start to uh, really advance a policy framework that uh, that takes Alberta into a a new future. I um, want to introduce quickly the uh, the moderator for today, and there's no one better to moderate this session than Susan. Susan Carlisle is the Clean Energy Manager for Alberta Innovates. She has 27 years of experience with the Government of Alberta, encompassing alternative and renewable energy, oil and gas, metallic and industrial minerals, and corporate services. From 2008 to 2015, as the Director Responsible for Alternative and Renewable Energy, she managed the bioenergy grant program development and implementation of Alberta's renewable fuel standard and inputs on climate change and innovation strategy. Up to 2018, Susan delivered bioeconomy and clean tech consulting services with a particular interest in alternative biomass feedstocks and supply chain development, rural economy and innovative value added products. Susan joined Alberta Innovates in January of last of 2019 serving as Interim Director of Water Innovation and Interim Clean Energy Manager, Bioenergy, and continues to support and advise on both portfolios. So Susan's in the, uh, in the studio with me today as we do the, uh, the hot swap and uh, keep, our, keep our social distancing and set um, uh, processes in place. But uh, I'm pleased to welcome Susan Carlisle to the floor. All yours, Susan. Officially unmasked. Good morning, everybody. Um, thank you, Rob, for inviting me to moderate this session today. Um, I should qualify that actually, as of Monday, I'm no longer the clean energy manager, but I'm still helping out with Alberta Innovates in any capacity they need. Uh, Mayor Niku has returned from her leave, so she's resumed that position, but I'm still helping out. Uh, before I introduce our panelists, I'd like to provide a, a, just a brief overview of my home organization, Alberta Innovates, and then cover a few housekeeping items. Um, Alberta Innovates is the province's largest research and innovation agency with over 550 employees and 11 locations throughout Alberta. We deliver funding programs, advice, connections, technical expertise, and applied research services to stimulate and grow research and innovation across Alberta. All our speakers today are well known to Alberta Innovates, uh, whether they are recipients of uh, grant funding or um, technical uh, applied research services from Innotech Alberta, or have served in advising us on developing our own bioenergy um, strategies and uh, uh, bioproduct strategies. Um, now for the housekeeping, we'll start with a keynote speaker and then we will hear presentations from three panelists followed by a panel discussion. Audience members are muted, but during the session, you can sit, submit your questions uh, for the panel discussion using the Q&A feature at the bottom of the screen. We may not be able to answer all your questions, but if your question has already be asked, been asked, add a thumbs up to upvote the question to give it a higher priority. So I would now like to introduce our keynote, David Lynch, the General Manager of Research and Development at Enerchem. Uh, Mr. Lynch manages pilot integration and testing that has provided data-driven support for Enerchem's commercial process design. Mr. Lynch orchestrated the bench scale development of Enerchem's methanol to ethanol process and has established pilot and laboratory facilities in Edmonton. David is an Energy Futures Lab Fellow, building on more than 25 years of industry experience where he advanced development and scaled up various new products 
and manufacturing processes. He holds a master of science degree in management of technology from Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute and a Bachelor of Science degree in chemistry from Fairfield University. Over to you, David. That's great. Thank you so much, Susan, and, and uh, to Alberta Innovates and, and uh, Bio Alberta for hosting this uh, session. I'm gonna go ahead and share my presentation here. Okay. Can you all see that okay? Okay, <laughs> thumbs up works. All right, so thanks again for the introduction. We're gonna to talk today a little bit about the Enerchem process and how we recycle carbon uh, from various sources um, into downstream products. Um, so first, a little bit about the, the company. Uh, for those of you who don't know Enercam, uh, we're, we're a, a medium-sized business uh, based here in Canada. Uh, we have operations here in Alberta as well as research and development capability. Um, we've developed a, an exclusive uh, feedstock flexible and multi-product technology, really a platform technology for the, the recycling and recovery of carbon from biomass and other, um, other uh, carbon sources. Uh, we were established in 2000, and uh, we also have commercial uh, facilities in operation. We focus on the production of low-cost advanced biofuels and also renewable chemicals. Um, we are a smart uh, waste management solution, as we can also use uh, uh, various types of waste, including um, uh, forest residues and agricultural residues as feedstocks. And... Um, We've got several international projects in development that are looking to do precisely this on a commercial scale. Um, some of the advantages of the process that we use uh, is, is that we're very feedstock flexible. So whether your, your carbon source is a municipal waste, uh, or if it contains various plastics, or if it's uh, biomass or contaminated biomass, um, we're able to extract the carbon from those carbon sources we convert it to a syngas, and then we convert that syngas into common uh, intermediates. Uh, namely, um, well, the syngas itself contains hydrogen and carbon monoxide. Uh, we produce ethanol from that syngas. We also produce methanol from that syngas. And as you'll see later in the presentation, those are key intermediates to, that lead to um, a variety of other products um, that can address local markets. Um, the markets that we focus on are the plastics and renewable chemicals markets, uh, transportation uh, fuels, as well as other uh, chemicals and um, consumer products. The way the process works is we have a, well, we take the feedstock, the feedstock is typically shredded, and we put that feedstock into our bubbling fluidized bed gasifier. In this very first stage of the process is where we extract the carbon from that feedstock in whatever form it was in and convert that carbon into a syngas. We then run that syngas through a series of gas conditioning steps that basically remove materials from the syngas that we don't want going over our catalyst. Um, we then run that syngas directly over a, a catalytic reactors that convert the syngas either to um, to uh, methanol or ethanol or other drop-in products. And um, we then go through the purification of those products. So that's really the process in a, in a nutshell. And we can tailor that process um, based on the downstream products. But really the, the front end of the process is very flexible in terms of the different feedstocks that it can take. Um, meaning that the gasifier can take municipal solid waste can take uh, the agricultural biomass, forestry biomass, or other types of uh, biomass materials. Um, so just a word about uh, uh, municipal solid waste as a biomass. This isn't typically considered a biomass, but typically municipal solid waste has 60 to 70% biogenic content in it. This comes from, from uh, various food waste that might be waste uh, mixed in with the, with the waste as well as uh, cardboard and paper products, often infused with plastic and, and other treatment processes that render it um, non-recyclable by other means. Um, and if we look at the, the available 
biomass, so the available waste uh, worldwide, this is really growing uh, internationally, really as, as uh, economies continue to grow and populations continue to grow around the world. Um, but back to Alberta, this is a photo of our, our full-scale facility here in Alberta. Um, and basically the process that you see before you, all of this process equipment is a biorefinery. Um, and the process flows basically the way the, the block flow diagram uh, uh, that I showed a few minutes ago uh, flows. So you've got your gasifier here behind the fans. The fans are for, for uh, cooling some of the, the water and the, the streams from the gas fire. Your gas conditioning process is here in the middle with the lights behind the, the square item. And then you, you run your syngas through the methanol part of the, the facility, which is right here behind this great building. Um, and then we also have the capability here in, in Alberta to convert that, uh, the methanol and syngas to ethanol. And the ethanol island is over on the far hand, right hand side here. So this facility is currently in operation here in Edmonton, Alberta. It is operating on um, municipal solid waste from the city of Edmonton, as well as some construction demolition debris materials that we take in here. So this has been a pretty significant milestone as a, as a biorefinery in Alberta. We've got well over 10,000 hours of cumulative operation in syngas and methanol production at this point. This has led to uh, the development of other commercial facilities, um, some of which I'll show a little bit later in the presentation. We've got well over 4 million liters of IMPCA grade methanol at this point, um, which can be used directly as uh, uh, chemical feedstock in the local uh, economy. It can also be used as a fuel and, and as a raw material for manufacture of, of other goods. Um, so this has really served as a reference plant to demonstrate the, the technology on a commercial scale. And it's really a, a testimony of the 25 years of innovation and development that Enerchem has put into the, the development and um, commercialization of this technology. So, and I wanna give a shout out to Alberta Innovates here because they have been a, a long time partner so, uh, of Enerchem and have assisted in, in this even from when we we're still at the pilot plant. So um, thank you for that. And also the government of Alberta and city of Edmonton have been key partners in, in making this a reality. The impact that this has had on the community as it's brought about about 750 jobs during the construction of the facility and, and the downstream uh, portions of the plant. Um, we employ currently about 50 people on site full time, um, but this also uh, echoes and ripples elsewhere in the uh, in the vocal economy. Um, so we also have um, various services that come in and assist with the maintenance of the facility. We we ship the um, the product from the plant here, and that and that employs truckers and and other uh, logistics personnel. Um, and of course, we've got all these people living here in the region, which contributes to, to restaurants and, and shops and everything else in the area. So it's, it's been very impactful. We estimate that about $65 million per year uh, that, that this project con contributes to the local economy. So it's, it's, uh, it is a significant um, uh, advancement and contributor to the uh, local uh, economy. It's also contributing significantly to reducing GHG emissions. So we estimate that about uh, that we reduce GHG emissions by about 60% compared to taking this waste and landfilling it and then using this gasoline. Um, so what we're doing instead is we're actually using the waste to make ethanol and or methanol and uh, and use that that material as a fuel uh, in vehicles. So when we look at how we're going to apply this to other products, this green box in the center here really lays out our core technology, where we take the waste biomass, convert it to syngas, and then convert that to methanol and ethanol. Um, this, is, this is the basic technology. But one of the things that I do as general manager of research and development is we look at well, what are the other things that we can make from this? What are the other products that we can, we can uh, 
make in order to leverage this technology to further develop the the uh, the economy and address um, economic needs. So so some of them are are outlined here. You've got diesel and SAF stands for sustainable aviation fuel. Um, gasoline that can be created directly from circular syngas. So that's one reason that's a really key intermediate. That process is called the fischer tropsch process. You can also take methanol and convert that to gasoline and SAF. This is a methanol to gasoline process. Um, both uh, fischer tropsch and methanol to gasoline uh, are commercially available processes that have been implemented on a commercial scale elsewhere in the world. And of course, you've got ethanol, which we use as a fuel, but is also readily converted to ethylene, which goes to make polyethylene. So in this way, you're able to take these core uh, intermediates, chemical intermediates, and address much larger markets that I think we're all familiar with in terms of the plastic market um, and, and the fuel market, both the jet fuel market and, and uh, vehicle market. When we look at this more from an industrial integration standpoint, and I think this is gonna be really key to the discussion later on where we start talking more about the, the bio-industrial strategy. Circular syngas instead of diesel and SAF, it doesn't need to be Enerchem that's making and selling the diesel and SAF directly. We could make a sync crude that's then integrated with other infrastructure in the region to make these products. Um, so that circular syngas can be used to make the same crude. It can also be used to make other circular chemicals, which are all produced here in Alberta. Um, so this is a, a key potential integration that, that we're looking at and we think can be key to this, uh, the bio-industrial strategy that we're discussing today. Uh, this is a little bit of, of color and on terms in terms of how we we could go about doing that. So I just I talked about the methanol to olefin type technology. These in this blue arrow, these are standard industrial uh, conversion processes. They are already on a commercial scale, and we're just really looking at adapting uh, those technologies to the the key intermediates that we typically use. Um, these aren't your normal hydrocarbon uh, intermediates that, that are mined from, from, say, the oil sands. And the key here is that we can address major uh, chemical markets in addition to just the fuel markets. Um, so, so propylene, ethylene, dimethyl ether is a common accelerant. You may not realize you use it all the time, but basically anytime you take an aerosol and spray it, Dimethyl ether is one of the most common uh, propellants that, that are used in those aerosol cans. Ethylene glycol, this is otherwise known as antifreeze. You use it in, in your vehicle. Acetic acid um, is, you know, it's uh, an upgraded vinegar, more or less, but it's used in many, many different types of polymers and, and materials, uh, as is acrylic acid. You may have heard of uh, acrylic paint, acrylic fabric. All of this comes from this acrylic acid monomer. Uh, that's a real key intermediate. So, so the idea is from, we can go from biomass to these key intermediates and then address a whole host of industrial markets. And this is a, a tremendous potential in terms of um, developing a strategy and positioning Enerchem, uh, not just Enerchem, but all of Alberta to address these markets. We talked earlier in the presentation about some of the uh, commercial developments. Uh, this is a, an image of our Varen uh, facility, which is our, our next Enerchem facility, which is being built just outside of Montreal. Um, this constitutes an $875 million investment. We're also installing one of the, the largest uh, industrial electrolyzers in the world uh, for the production of, of hydrogen and, and oxygen as part of this project. Um, and we've got some, some great partners in the form of, of Suncor, um, as well as Shell, Proman, and the best of us, Mont, uh, Quebec. Um, so this is, this is um, a great uh, validation and, and really uh, speaks to, to uh, the Edmonton plant as a, as a forerunner for these types of, of global developments. Um, so in addition to seeing growth in, in Alberta, we're also seeing growth elsewhere in Canada and around the world. Uh, this is a summary of our waste to chemicals plant in Rotterdam. 
Um, so this is really uh, focused more on the circular economy using waste carbon that's available in Rotterdam uh, and converting that to, um, to methanol and other uh, products that address both the, the chemical circular economy as well as fuels. And the, uh, the third facility, uh, example facility I've got here is for um, Spain. This is Tarragona, Spain, and it's, uh, it's going to be a facility. It's a little more than two times the kit capacity of what we have here in Alberta. Um, the feedstock, again, is going to be non-recyclable waste, as well as the commercial and institutional sectors. But biomass is a, con is a significant portion of that. Uh, again, we, we expect somewhere between 65 and 75 percent of the uh, feedstock coming into this plant to be biogenic or bio-derived. So that's an, an, important, uh, an important contributor to making both uh, renewable fuels as well as renewable chemicals and products. Um, it looks like I'm a little bit ahead of time. Um, really, so these, these plants and the technology that I've laid out is really speaks to the vision of making better use of, of carbon that we have available to us. And I think this speaks very well to the um, to better using the biocarbon that we have present in Alberta as biomass uh, and leveraging that to address uh, market needs. Um, so we can discuss it further in the panel, but uh, my vision is really to leverage the infrastructure that we have here in Alberta to better use the, the carbon that we have available to us here in Alberta. So I think that's it for my, uh, for my presentation. Thank you again for your time and uh, look forward to your questions during the panel session. Thank you, David. And uh, the, yeah, the fact that David finished early uh, will just mean more time for discussion at the end. Um, I would now like to introduce members of the panel. So I'm gonna do all their biographies first. They will do their presentations and after their presentations, David will join the panel and we will commence the panel discussion. So that is where your, uh, your Q&A contributions will be um, addressed. So I'd like to start with um, uh, giving an intro uh, for Rob Lavoie, President and CEO of AirTerra Inc. Rob's first career was as a reservoir engineer for Shell Canada, working on many carbon capture and storage and enhanced oil recovery projects followed by independent consulting focusing on CCS projects in Western Canada. In 2009, Rob founded AirTerra to explore the potential for biochar as a valuable enhanced enhancement agent and a renewable energy source. In 2015, AirTerra registered as the first CFIA registered biochar product for sale across Canada. That was soil matrix biochar. Now AirTerra is planning to build a biochar production facility in, in near Calgary that will not only produce biochar, but will also have the capacity to generate renewable electricity and or drop in low carbon liquid transportation fuel. So that's Rob. And now Greg Caldwell is director of the Utility Hydrogen Strategy with ATCO. Uh, Mr. Caldwell's professional experience consists of engineering, business strategy, finance, and regulatory policy in the energy industry. He is most, his most recent experience has been focused on areas of business strategy, utility regulation, energy policy, and applied innovation, delivering low carbon energy solutions. Greg's current focus is leading ATCO's development of a hydrogen strategy, which encompasses the technical policy, regulatory and economic aspects of the initiative. Greg was also instrumental in the Fort Saskatchewan hydrogen blending project, which was a first of its kind in Alberta. He currently participates on national and international committees with the Canadian Gas Association and in partnership with multiple levels of government focusing on the funding and testing of emerging technologies aimed at combating climate change, as well as promoting energy security and developing alternative pathways for Canadians to provide their energy needs. In addition, 
He serves as the Canadian Chair of the International Gas Union, or ITU, Research and Development Committee, as well as on the Energy Transition Advisory Committee, which advises the City of Edmonton on methods to implement their community energy strategy. So in addition to all those things that Greg does, he is married with two children, enjoys playing ice hockey, scuba diving, adventure travel, and continually learning about new technologies and strategies to solve the challenges currently facing industry and society. And thirdly, last but not least, Doug Hooper, Director of Policy and Regulation with Advanced Biofuel Canada. Biofuels Canada, apologies, Doug. Doug, um, since 19, uh, since, sorry, 2005, Doug has helped lead the development of Canada's advanced biofuels sector. He has worked directly on all key federal and provincial energy and climate action policies in Canada, including renewable and low carbon fuel regulations, carbon pricing and fiscal policies to build biofuel production capacity and expand clean fuel use. So presenta presentations will now start with Rob Lavoie, immediately followed by Greg Caldwell and then Doug Hooper. And after that, we'll have the panel discussion. Thank you. So am I on here now? So that's my presentation. Uh, and so thank you everyone for this opportunity to speak to you this morning. Uh, I'm Rob Lavoie, CEO of um, and founder of Airterra Inc. And uh, Airterra exists to provide a solution to two coinciding problems. There's currently an overload of CO2 in Earth's atmosphere. And of course, this needs no further dispute on this panel. Um, at the same time, carbon, uh, soil carbon has depleted as a result of modern mechanized farming practices and the overuse of chemical fertilizers and herbicides and pesticides. And uh, Airterra is seeking to address this issue. Uh, Airterra sees, two up, sees an opportunity to cooperate with nature to answer these two problems by making use of photosynthesis to move carbon from the atmosphere back into soils. Air Terra's advisory committee arrived at the slogan, um, capturing carbon for good. Uh, or, and uh, our flagship initial product, Soil Matrix Biochar, uh, Don Harfield, our VP of Technology and Operations coined the phrase, uh, biochar, chicken soup for the soil. Um, during his time as the director of the Alberta Biochar Initiative. Biochar is made by employing the use of thermochemical conversion of residual biomass into biochar as a soil amendment product with combined heat and power. There is also the potential to generate renewable natural gas and or low carbon liquid biofuels as part of the process. Our proposed feedstock is a combination of forest industry and agricultural residuals including possible harvesting of trees removed to construct fire guard zones, fire suppression, thin forests, cut lines, and the clearing of land for development. Essentially, no woody fiber should be allowed to simply decompose <clears throat> in landfills, slash piles, or stockpiles. If we reach the limit uh, on residuals, which we are far from at this point, as uh, mentioned by David, um, we will turn in the future to establish uh, sustainable practices for purpose-grown trees such as Copus willow plantation operations currently taking place near Calgary in a partnership with Silvis Environmental local farmers in the city of Calgary. Moreover, there is no need to stay with a monoculture of willow trees and a, and a, bio, and a biochar feedstock does not need to be derived from wood-grown for the production of dimensional lumber, we could promote a coppice woody polyculture of shelter belts harvested triennially in a circular economy for mixed farming. This would add wind erosion protection for farmlands. Farmers could benefit from participating in the, associ in the associated carbon credits attached to growing trees on their land and sequestering carbon into animal bedding first, eventually uh, into the depleted soils of their organic farms 
as in a series of stacked functions for biochar. We will need significant encouragement from um, initial federal and provincial funding to demonstrate such a radical change in farming practices. Ever increasing levies on CO2 emissions will add to this proposition in the years to come. So the process will involve the pyrolysis or gasification at, a temp at temperatures of 400 to 800 degrees C, similar to the one uh, uh, discussed by David in the uh, keynote speech, uh, in a similar way as the Enercan process in Edmonton, and will generate water vapor, um, hydrogen, carbon monoxide, uh, some, some methane possibly, and some bio oils and solid bio carbon, biochar, high carbon content uh, and low ash is, the, is what we're seeking for our product. Biochar is a highly stable material and is resilient to decomposition in soils, but highly beneficial for soils. As such, it is now recognized by the UN as both a climate change mitigation and adaptation technology. Our currently planned plant will require 60 tons per day of feedstock, uh, woody biomass. It will generate 10 tons or more per day of biochar. The syn gas components will be used to provide heat for the process, as well as enough excess energy to power a two megawatt power plant with additional available heat for drying feedstock and for building heat, etc. This is a future potential. There is a few future potential to condense the liquids from the syngas to generate a drop-in ready biofuel for transportation, but that wouldn't be where we begin. Uh, I just mentioned also that this uh, this plant will likely uh, employ about 20 Albertans, plus many spin-off businesses, as also mentioned by David. Alberta is an ideal province to serve as an anchor location to demonstrate the potential to make use of residual biomass as a source of carbon for agricultural inputs and for soil remediation. The forest zones are well distributed along the western half of Alberta, as well as the northern half. Agriculture is distributed in the southeast and the northwestern and central areas of Alberta. Oil and gas and oil sand sites uh, that currently need to be reclaimed are distributed throughout Alberta. Alberta is an excellent bioresource, has an excellent bioresource information management system, or BRIMS, that provides online data to enable informed resource management and investment decisions. Biochar has a number of beneficial attributes for soils, and this will be our focus at the start. Every aspect of soil physiology is improved when biochar is amended along with adequate organic plant nutrients. One of its most important and powerful attributes is the ability to stimulate beneficial microbial activity uh, to enable greater crop yields for organic agricultural practices. Airterra is promoting the use of biochar as a co-composting ingredient for manure and municipal source separated organics. This slide shows a few photos from our early work with farmers who are using biochar as an animal bedding ingredient for cattle and poultry barns. This makes use of, a, of biochar in a stacked function manner where it serves to improve bedding conditions and odor issues in the barns, followed by co-composting of the spent bedding. The Water and Waste Policy Branch of Alberta Envi Environment and Parks is currently reviewing the code of practice for compost facilities under the Environmental Protection and Enhancement Act of Alberta. Don Harfield and I participated as co-contributors to the EAP's request for public review last summer, and we believe that the biochar amendment into animal manures will be included as a recommended practice for manure compost makers in Alberta. We, this will open the door to the ability to construct a plant the size we're envisioning, but there will need to be, there will be a need for municipal, provincial, and federal governments to promote this as a significant new industry in Canada. A good example of this kind of, uh, uh, it, business uh, structure is the City of Calgary's P Triple P model 
for the Calgary Composting Facility, which is a partnership between AIM Environmental and the City of Calgary. More of the, these triple P partnerships are needed to promote new technologies such as this one. So thank you very much and uh, I'll be available for questions afterwards. Thank you, Rob. Um, I we're, we're, uh, uh, thank you very much for that presentation. Just a reminder to the audience to input your Q&A questions or upvote questions. And I'd now like to uh, shift to Greg, Greg Caldwell with ATCO. Thank you. Um, and thanks to everyone for joining. I'm just gonna share my screen and get going. Uh, so I know introductions were uh, a few minutes ago. Uh, my, my current title is, is Director of Utility Hydrogen Strategy, but really within the team I work with, we, we have a clean fuel strategy and um, there's a lot happening in this space right now. So I hope to, uh, um, I hope to really just share my thoughts around how utilities can support the development of clean fuels in Alberta, as well as um, where we kind of see the world going. And I'm going to get into policy a little bit. Um, I only have four or five slides, uh, so it's going to be quick. And I'm hoping that since I'm, uh, I think I'm the last or the second last speaker, I, I will, uh, um, it'll, it'll help with some questions from the audience that, that I think the whole group can, can answer. So just quickly about ATCO for those of you that don't know, uh, because it's one of these virtual events, I don't know if everyone's from Alberta. I don't know if you know about us, but uh, we're a gas and electric distributor in Alberta, as well as uh, logistics and, and housing company in many jurisdictions, jurisdictions, excuse me, around the world. But the organization that I work with directly is the gas utility company. Um, within the shaded area here. Uh, we serve most of Alberta, along with a, a few other smaller utilities and, and all the major centers you see uh, highlighted. So I'm gonna get right into um, renewable natural gas and, and hydrogen a little bit and then into policy. So this is a slide we, we stole with permission um, from uh, the strategy in Quebec. And I just wanna be really clear because we, you know, within the utility community or even within the energy community in general, you hear a lot of the time with these technologies that were even just presented, that either there's not enough supply or the cost is too high and all this stuff. And, and what I wanna be really clear about is, yes, traditional fossil fuel is pretty cheap um, when it doesn't have a carbon tax on it and, and plentiful. And so that's a challenge for, for biofuels. However, uh, we believe biofuels have a, a huge part to play in our energy future. And really, I, I think this slide captures it well, the only really mature technologies are those first generation technologies right now. Um, now, David may say his technology is very mature and I know he's gasifying things. So that's a broad statement. It's not meant to be critical, but when, when we look around the world, we see mostly you know, biomethanation and capture but there's a lot that can that can change over the next uh, years and decades to come to really grow that market. And, and we see um, whether it's hydrogen, renewable gases or synthetic gases even, we, we, we see a really strong future for that. And we also see prices um, getting more and more competitive with fossil gases because of the carbon taxation policies we see in Canada. So what do the prices look like? And I, I'm going right to price because I honestly think it is um, the most important uh, aspect of all of this. And, and we, we just got to talk about it, but um, the yellow bars in here, you see um, where RNG can kind of play. And this is where we see it playing um, today. Obviously those, those prices can change and um, you're gonna have uh, just traditional natural gas with a carbon tax between that 10 to $15 a gig, it's not on here, but between that 10 to $15 a gigajoule cost in 2030 because of the $170 a ton carbon tax. So, you know, RNG can really play a part, I think, in our energy system in the future. And, um, you know, it's, uh, it, it, it's really, 
I, I think important to share that because the, the argument has been a lot of the time, well, it's too expensive. Natural gas is three bucks a gigajoule. So there's just no place for it. And, and what we've seen and, and going into provincial policies here, British Columbia, Quebec, Ontario, we've seen some governments decide, no, there is a place for it. We're, we're going to incent the industry. We're, we're going to put in some programs that really help the use of, of these, these gases um, to, to get into the utility system. And, um, and we're going to support it either via rates or via carbon tax revenues. There's all sorts of ways they're doing it. Um, I think a lot of the people on this, on this uh, panel, as well as in this conference, are probably aware of that. But I just thought I'd list those um, as saying that, you know, Alberta is probably, um, I, won't, I won't say we're lagging, but we just haven't made a decision about if we want to do this or not. So um, there's some models we could copy or, or we could create our own, our own models to really support this. And what I want to tie that back to is, you know, we're, we're sitting at a place right now in Alberta where, you know, our, our traditional energy industries are, are challenged mainly because of, um, you know, mac macroeconomic and, and policy factors that we don't control. Like we don't control, um, you know, necessarily what Canada is going to agree to at the next COP conference and, and what the prime minister is going to agree to how fast to get to net zero by 2050, which by the way, there is a, um, there's a bill in front of parliament right now that that will basically force that legally um, as bill C12, if you're not aware. So I just want to leave with some, I'm not going to say solutions, I'm going to leave with some, some ideas here. So we're paying a carbon levy and in all Albertans pay a carbon levy when they fill up with gasoline or, or use natural gas. Um, you know, our what could we do with those funds? Those funds go to Ottawa today. Uh, those of you that have been around a while will remember those funds used to stay in Alberta and be used for uh, programming here in Alberta. So there, there's some opportunities there. Um, also, what is the, you know, what is the emission reduction strategy for Alberta for, I'll, I'll call it non-industrial end use. So most of the customers we serve, um, that would be your house, the businesses that, that you, you go to, the restaurants, et cetera, uh, hospitals, and, and should utilities be supportive or supporting the growth of this, um, the growth of, of this strategy and, and the growth of this market? And I put RNG and hydrogen. I just like to talk about decarbonized or clean fuels. Um, I don't think we should pick winners. I think we should have a bit of everything because without I, I very limited time, but without getting into it, there, there isn't a silver bullet. Uh, we're going to need everything to achieve our, our, our climate goals. And so I think some provinces, you know, have played favorites to some extent with you know, whether it's electrification or renewable gas, or in some cases, hydrogen is, is now becoming a, a very popular solution, but I think we're going to need everything. And so how, how can we support that? So I'm just going to leave that there and, and um, the attendees at this conference can figure out which questions they want to ask and, and go from there. So I'll, uh, I'll stop talking and hand it, hand it back to the moderator. Thank you, Greg. Um, I'm sure it gives people lots of food for thought. And our final presentation will be Doug Hooper from Advanced Biofuels Canada. Good morning, everyone, and thank you, Susan, and, uh, and uh, Bio Alberta, and my fellow panelists for the opportunity to, to meet with you here this morning. Um, I'm going to uh, take a moment to go right up to the policy level um, and talk very broadly about um, all of the different levers that are impacting um, bio and, and some other non bio um, uh, clean energy, uh, low emission technologies. I'm going to start with a short introduction of Advanced Biofuels Canada so you know who we are, uh, and then talk uh, about the clean fuel standard a little bit, and then touch on these other policy levers. Let me see if I got the technology here to switch slides. Advanced Biofuels Canada is a, a national organization representing the supply chain for bio and, and uh, synthetic non fossil clean liquid fuels. We've got producers and suppliers of, uh, of those fuels um, located across Canada. We're predominantly uh, represented right now by members that have uh, assets and operations in the Western uh, provinces and Ontario and Quebec. 
And the middle bar in this slide um, are the fuels that you're probably familiar. We've been talking about methanol and advanced ethanol, and there's the other uh, biofuels and sustainable aviation fuel, which used to be called biojet. We're gonna have to update this slide. Um, and there's quite a number of, of co-products, um, mostly bio-based that come from these processes. And we've listed some of the process names on the left. So to jump into the policy environment, the, um, uh, I, think the, I think the key message here is that environmental policies are now primary economic drivers. And this is, this is not just in Canada, this is a, a global um, situation. There's a lot of uh, policy work being done under the mantra of build back better, which is uh, intended to really re use the opportunity of the reinvestment and um, public investment um, coming out of the COVID recovery to direct it to lower carbon, uh, lower emitting uh, platforms that will support economic growth going forward and towards 2030 and meeting the net zero 2050 goals that we've talked about. Federally, uh, you are probably aware that the federal government announced a um, strengthened climate plan in December, which includes over, I think it's 64 measures representing over $15 billion of um, investments, mostly over the next five to 10 year period. And in Alberta, uh, earlier this week, um, Minister Nixon kicked off a, um, a climate policy engagement process, which has got a number of roundtables, including one on technology and bio-based solutions, um, which addresses all of the things that we're talking about here today. And this, this policy review is going to be conducted over uh, the next few months until May. And it's a great opportunity for us uh, individually and collectively to put our thoughts forward. And I'll come back and wrap up on that subject at the end. So here's, here's one configuration of the orbit of issues. It's not just clean fuel standards and renewable fuel standards. There's carbon pricing on fuels, there's carbon pricing on industrial emissions. Um, and then there's a myriad of other signals that have very significant bearing on capital investments and, uh, and decisions as to what products and, and co-products uh, will make their way into this, into this uh, future economy. So I'll touch on these individually. Starting with the clean fuel standard, um, there, uh, the draft of the regulation was published in December. The, um, the final regulation is planned for this coming December with an implementation um, then to follow in, in 2022, at the end of 2022. We've done some modeling uh, just prior to the release of the draft regulation. We, we posted this on our website and you, you're welcome to go there and, and download. Uh, the details, including the uh, the data sets behind it, we make that available. Generally, what the the it's, and it's very complex to model, but generally, what the the market signal looks like is we should see an increase in um, non fossil low, what they call low carbon intensity fuels, so biofuels, synthetic fuels, uh, as well as uh, switching to um, non internal combustion engine platforms like electric vehicles and hydrogen vehicles. In the, um, in the liquid fuel space, we could see demand for biodiesel, renewable diesel, and, uh, and ethanol um, climbing substantially. And in a, in, in a scenario where we see biofuels and synthetic fuels uh, achieving about 50% of the compliance obligation by 2030, we did economic modeling on top of the, um, uh, the supply demand study uh, and, and looked at the impact on jobs and, and economic output. And it could be, as, uh, it could be over 20,000 new jobs and representing about $10 billion plus of uh, new economic output. That study is also available on the website. So although we're very focused um, in, the, in the past years on the clean fuel standard, which is a federal regulation under the Environmental Protection Act, it's important to keep in mind that uh, a number of provinces have renewable fuel standards or an LCFS in British Columbia. And these are fundamentally a, um, a floor for the demand side uh, of fuel use in these, in these jurisdictions. So from British Columbia to Ontario, we have regulations in place now and Quebec is developing one. When they implement their, their renewable fuel standard, it'll represent about 92% of the, the liquid fuels used in Canada. So that's uh, important to look at the different jurisdictions to see what those drivers are. Right now in Alberta, uh, the, the standard's been 5% in gasoline, 2% in diesel since 2011. It's at the lower end of the demand signal. Um, but it is notable that, that Alberta, when they introduced their standard, was the first jurisdiction to 
uh, to regulate uh, greenhouse gas emissions in renewable fuel standards. There's a 25% minimum reduction requirement. I'm going to flip very quickly through the um, through the, some of the pricing signals, um, and just to show you what they are, and then I'll I'll leave them um, for later discussion. But credit values are an important component of of driving investment in innovation and and, and emission reduction. Um, and the credit values in the in the clean fuel standard were modeled in in across four different scenarios. They don't get as high as what we see in British Columbia and California because there's a lot more pathways to compliance in the CFS, but you could see credit values pushing up uh, between uh, $75 and $140. In addition to uh, credit values under, this, under the regulations, there's also a carbon price exemption that applies to biofuels if they're used above 10% in gasoline and above 5% in diesel. And these are significant. Right now, gasoline is, is um, taxing carbon at about 11 cents a liter. That could grow to 37 cents in 2030. Diesel's 13 cents and could grow to 45. So the, the magnitude of that carbon price exemption becomes very important. And if you combine that magnitude of the carbon tax exemption with the credit value for using these higher carbon, or sorry, higher blend biofuel blends, um, you start to see some of the some of the the monetary drivers that'll be in the market. You could right now sell biodiesel um, if there was a hundred dollar credit price in the market for the CFS, uh, B99 would, would save you 39 cents. In 2030, uh, at the same credit value, it would be 71 cents per liter. So you start to set up some, some um, market signals that will drive consumers to switch to um, higher level blends of, of biofuels. Fuel taxes also play into it. I'm not going to spend much time on this slide, but it, just to note that right now our tax system's not taxing electric vehicles and um, uh, hydrogen fuel cell vehicles or natural gas vehicles in the same manner as, as liquid fuels. And uh, there will need to be some policy um, realignment uh, in order to adjust for the, the revenue side of what's needed for roads and bridges and tunnels. Uh, Greg and I think the other um, panelists have touched on uh, fuel pricing as it applies to emitters. This is, uh, of course, an area where Alberta has its own structure with the tier program, and it's been a facility that's helped fund a lot of the innovation and, and opportunities to, to um, decarbonize in Alberta. Uh, there are a number of these policies across Canada, in addition to the, the federal output-based pricing system. What's important is that the the, the same activity that can be undertaken to reduce your emissions in your industrial pricing system in tier uh, can also be eligible for credit generation in the clean fuel standard. That's another big driver. ZEV mandates uh, have, been, have been mentioned. They, uh, these are a growing um, factor on, on uh, transportation fuels and the impact on gasoline in particular for light duty vehicles. And you see these mandates um, are coming up fairly quickly on the inside to represent a requirement that 100% of vehicle sales by 2035 or 2040 um, be ZEV platforms. So electric vehicles or hydrogen platforms, that's, that's going to constitute significant demand destruction. But at the end of the day, we still see that we're um, this, this orange area here is, is the decline in, in demand for uh, liquid fuels on the light duty fleet and the blue side is electric. And even a, going out to uh, 2045, 2050, there's still quite a, a pool of uh, fuels, um, internal combustion engines that'll need to decarbonize. Canada and the US have um, initiated now discussions between the Biden and Trudeau administrations. They're looking at just a, at the ZEV situation, but a, uh, fuel emission standards, clean fuel corridors, standards and regulations to support that. And I'll note at the bottom there that the, um, the focus on aviation, rail and marine is really providing significant opportunities for renewable diesel and, uh, and co-processed fuels. And this is where Alberta has got a, a great opportunity. Policies and programs. Um, these slides, by the way, are, are available for your use. So um, apologies for going quickly and you're welcome to, to download these and go back over them. And, connect with me if it helps. Uh, there are a number of policies directly in the federal program. And of course, the, the province is looking at uh, um, economic opportunities around CCS and CCUS. I've just got a, a couple of seconds left. So I want to jump to 
really where it focuses in terms of investments and opportunities. And, and this barrel represents how do you decarbonize? And 25% of the emissions from a life cycle basis are based on the upstream extraction of the oil and the processing of it. 77% relate to combustion. And that's where biofuels, synthetic fuels, renewable natural gas, EVs and hydrogen come in. And so we can focus a lot on decarbonizing the upstream part, but the, where other jurisdictions are trying to take emissions out of transportation really relate to that top section. Advanced Biofuels Canada has got quite an um, active uh, portfolio of capital projects across our membership base. Um, out to 2030, there's over 60 different projects um, representing over $15 billion in capital investment. And this is, I'll, I'll finish here with sort of where I began. The, from, um, from a policy perspective, um, this is the moment. Uh, the uh, Alberta government has now kicked off this consultation and it's an important opportunity to speak to the, the, the goals that they've, to, or, or the items that they've described as in scope um, for, the, for the discussion as to how Alberta can better be, uh, can better position itself for the jobs and economic growth in the future. And, I'll note that one of their key focus areas is um, negative emissions technologies. And this is where we can combine bioenergy systems with carbon capture and storage or carbon capture and use and, uh, and really uh, achieve net uh, negative emission uh, outcomes in the province. So I'll leave it there, turn it back to you, Susan. And um, thank you again for the opportunity to be here today. All right. Thank you, Doug. Um, so that concludes our presentations. And I think we do have a few uh, questions that have come in during the sessions. And so now our panelists, so everybody who presented included David Lynch are, are now comprise our panel. And so uh, now I will momentarily um, receive questions. I just have to find them. Okay, so I think, it, yes, the first question is for David Lynch. And that question is, uh, what is, what was the investment, um, what was Investment Quebec's involvement in your joint venture? I don't have the precise numbers offhand in terms of what share that they, uh, they invested. Um, so I'm, I'm sorry, I'd, I'd have to get back to you on that. I don't, I don't have the breakout of who invested how much into that project. Okay. And um, we have a question for Greg. Is there something that Alberta's governing bodies can change today that could promote growth in the, the biotech sector? That might be the biochar sector too. Um, yeah. So I, I, I'll, I'll just, I think I understand the question. Um, it, like biochar, as I understand it, is uh, like an output of, you know, some gasification technologies. So if, if the idea is that you're making some a renewable or, or low carbon gas um, I, and how we could play is, is I think there's an opportunity to um, allow utilities like gas utilities to, to, to purchase these types of fuels and, and bring them into their system like you see in British Columbia or, or Quebec. Um, and so I think that's how we can support those sort of projects. Um, I hope that's the question. Uh, the person Rob, who, if the person who asked it wants to yeah. follow up. And, and I think we could address this more generally then. So biotech could be any, any of these, uh, you know, by industrial innovation. So uh, Rob and, and David, uh, you may also have comment as well as Doug. Yeah, so um, I would just uh, submit that we need to get this industry started. And uh, so there are a lot of uh, needs for demonstration projects in order to, to explore a bunch of these technologies and get them to scale. I mean, research is great too. I mean, that that's all feeds into the, the, the quality of these demonstration projects. But in order to move quickly, we need to have demonstrations and municipal, provincial, and federal governments are a huge um, possible customers 
for those demonstration projects. And they could actually participate in, an, in triple P kinds of investment approaches so that uh, there's not a shortage of funding and support for those uh, early uh, sort of anchor projects of different types of biorefinery uh, technologies. Yeah. David or Doug, did you want to add comment? I'll jump in if David's going to be shy. Yeah, I'll let you go ahead. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, important to keep in mind that uh, not everything's about dollars uh, coming from the government. They're in addition to um, funding opportunities. They've got the levers, of course, of uh, regulations and uh, and taxation, et cetera. And I think in a in a post COVID fiscal reality, governments are going to be increasingly strapped in terms of uh, their dollar resources and and and, and reinvestment programs. I will point out, however, though, that in the federal uh, strength and climate plan, the, the, there is a funding facility of $750 million directed to SDTC. And they've done a great job in, uh, in working on uh, demonstration and um, scaling up uh, pilot uh, uh, technologies all the way through to commercialization. On the, on the non-funding uh, side, there is a 50% tax cut proposed for the manufacturer of clean uh, uh, clean technologies that would include biofuels and, and everything on this panel. And so uh, provinces have the opportunity to, to match that kind of inducement to get economic, to get commercial um, platforms built in the province. And, uh, and of course, they've got the, the shred program around uh, research and uh, expenditures on uh, RD and D. So uh, you know, there's those those kinds of opportunities. The single biggest one in our sector is is fuel regulation, and there's an opportunity there really to improve the Alberta RFS in two ways. One to um, to raise the floor so that there's a um, there's a defined level of contribution from non fossil uh, fuels, as well as um, implement a credit system. It's really um, an important component of the of the modern uh, regulatory systems to have a uh, transparent credit market, and that allows capital market investors to uh, to come to the table and, and see how they'll get returns on the different technologies. So th both of those elements, I think, are are um, an opportunity for Alberta. Uh, David, do you have any additions to that? So, though we do have a few more questions. No, I thought I thought those were great. Points and additions. I, I think. I think generally, what I'd be looking for is to see um, promotion. It doesn't necessarily mean dollars invested, but I'd like to see promotion of uh, leveraging the existing infrastructure that we have here in Alberta towards using biocarbon more. Um, so we've got we've got a lot of refinery infrastructure. We've got we've got all sorts of reforming. We've got hydrogen generation, uh, and I think I think. The more that we can say, okay, you guys have, you know how to handle carbon, you know how to make great products. Let's try to leverage that infrastructure more towards biocarbon and using biogenic carbon. I think that would both um, promote the use of our existing infrastructure. I think it would pr um, help put Alberta as a, as a leader in, the, in this space because we have the infrastructure already. And I think it would also um, contribute to GHG um, emission reduction. Um, given we, we have about uh, six minutes left, so I'm just going to raise one of the meatier questions that has come up. Um, and so this question to all panelists. So Alberta is kicking off its climate review at the same time that the new U.S. administration's approach is being formed. In your opinion, what are some areas of integration and how should this integration be considered in Alberta's review? Um. I'm happy to start maybe and then hand it off to, to the other panelists. Uh, um, so I think uh, I talked in my presentation how there's these like macroeconomic and policy things that are changing that we don't control. And that's one of them. You know, when you have the world's largest economy deciding to, whether it's new green deal or whatever we're calling it now, they are moving towards a, a lower carbon economy I think everything everyone said in this panel is we have solutions and we have um, technologies that can help, but I think we have to do it here first before we can really go to the world and say like David's project's a good example. They did it here first and 
now they have people investing in China and in Quebec. Like we have to go do that here first. And so whether it's, um, you know, a technology like Rob's working on, well, how do we support those companies and, and create the policy framework? So I, I think we need to, um, you know, just be brave in, in the policies that are recommended provincially and, and try some stuff that we haven't tried before. Um, and that's kind of what my slides were about is, is, you know, using some of the industries to help enable other ones to get going. I'll hand it off to others. Well, I'll, 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 I'll jump in. Sorry, Doug. I'll, I'll just jump, jump in. And, and um, I, I think that bio, uh, the um, bio Alberta can really serve a, 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 an excellent uh, purpose. And that is to, uh, to sort of create a roadmap for the use of biomass in, in Alberta or anywhere actually in terms of a hierarchy for use because it would be um really you know there's a lot of these technologies that i think of as transitional technologies they're bridges to get us to a more sustainable future like biofuels for example or uh, uh, bioethanols ethanols and, and 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 sort of single use products made from bio resources because um if you start to convert to bio resources as this feedstock for everything, um, how soon do you become oversubscribed? And uh, what would be a shame is to have uh, these sort of single use products going all over the world uh, and using up the bio resources for local, uh, potentially longer term carbon, you know, resi resilient long term carbon, like carbon, biocarbon composites used for building materials, for example, that are long lasting and for soil, and I'm being selfish here because my industry is really fo focusing on biochar for soils as a long, resilient, long time storage of carbon and as a drawdown or carbon negative technology versus uh, biofuels being carbon neutral only at best. Um, we don't wanna oversubscribe the biomass resources of Alberta and start changing land use uh, for the, the boreal forests of, of Canada. Uh, we we don't we want to preserve the current footprint of our our forest zones, and um, and potentially you know even increase those forest zones uh, for for biomass production. So that would be my concern, and I think a Manhattan project is necessary to create that hierarchy of use. Uh, David, do you have any additions? Um, no, I I think. Uh... Yeah, I think what what Rob is talking about in terms of of the, the responsible forest management and and really we've already got a very good inventory of the the carbon and bio resources that are available here in Alberta. Um, what we're not doing a great job of is figuring out how to leverage those in an organized manner. Um, as far as I know. Um, I think I think Doug has laid out some some great economic incentives. We know where we know where the economics are going, and this is what he laid out is driving economic change um, that the U.S. is subscribing for. We know this is happening. We we see this happening happening also in Europe, in terms of you know we're we're breaking the 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 need for price parity on these on these products and and recognizing that there is higher value in having bio-based products and the more that we can do that and accept that the policies that are being incorporated in the u.s are going to contribute to this this rise in in uh in acceptance of these of the higher prices um this this is going to this is only going to make the the bioeconomy more of a, a prevalent uh, and common thing. The key is getting us on board with that and making sure that we're in a position where we're making the products necessary for that economy. Yeah, and I, I think I think the key I think the key to that is to be carbon competitive, and you know fundamentally the 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 Zev uh, proposition is zero emissions, and what they're talking about there is emissions on. Uh, com on combustion, there there aren't any on an electric vehicle and, and a hydrogen fuel cell vehicle, but the internal combustion engine, um, uh, of course, has um, emissions upstream as well as at the combustion level, and they they 
in total have to be competitive with the ZEV platform and can be. And I think what the Biden administration and, and the Trudeau government said earlier this last week was um, they're going to they're aiming at um, decarbonizing the grid. They're aiming at decarbonizing fuels. So if you keep in mind that we're going to be driving internal combustion engines um, on the road as well as in aviation, marine, and rail for a long time to come, the, really the opportunity for Alberta here is to decarbonize uh, its contribution to those uh, internal combustion engines um, first and foremost. That's and we can uh, we can do that both upstream as well as by um, integrating more sustainable. Um, synthetic and, and, uh, and bio-based fuels. And to Rob's point, uh, we've got a lot of biomass. Uh, the, the trick is to make sure that it's uh, sustainably produced, um, uh, properly scored into the global market to assure its environmental integrity. Uh, and there's, there's, there's a lot of work being done on that in the clean fuel standard and with global standards. And I, I'm very confident that Western Canada, all of Canada um, has a, has a considerable role to play in the sustainable biomass and waste to, to uh, the other platforms. So Thank you, Doug. Um, I, I think we were just warming up on our, our panel discussions, but we, we our time is up. And uh, so uh, uh, thank you, uh, panelists, and thank you, audience. Rob is going to make some closing remarks. And, and Rob, if you could also just, in your closing remarks, address the question of access to slides after this event. Thank you. Um, I, I feel like the mean parent coming in and telling uh, uh, everybody to uh, to be quiet and go to sleep. Uh, I, I really, it's really too bad. We uh, are going to temporarily end this conversation. Um, I talked earlier about a bio uh, uh, developing and coordinating a bio uh, bioindustrial framework. And I think uh, just based on the questions coming in and the content today, uh, I, I, I can feel we're going to get a lot of help and support with that. So um, if you want to be in, if you want to be involved in developing that framework, um, send us a note. We'll be communicating through our regular channels, but uh, um, please, uh, please feel free to reach out and say, I want to help with that. Uh, just send me an email, robb at bioalberta.com. Um, as we will, with um, um, with the permission of the presenters, we will make slides available. Um, in addition, we're going to have uh, um, at least the panel sessions um, available for those who fill out the feedback form after the sessions, so uh, that you will have access for at least a 30-day uh, period of time once we're able to post this. So we'll make sure we get that information. Uh, out to everybody. Uh, and as I've said before, with the questions, if, they, if we didn't get any questions or you have further questions, uh, it's no problem. We'll, uh, we'll get answers to those. Um, we're right on time. We're going to take a, a couple minutes break to get the next, uh, uh, the next session set up. Um, thank you so much to Dave, Rob, Doug, and Greg to, uh, uh, for your content and your discussion today. Thank you so much, Susan, for being such a uh, such a great moderator and a contact contact expert. We're really uh, really blessed with uh, with to have this group with us this morning. Uh, when we come back at twelve thirty, uh, you will be uh, met by Nuzat um, Taman, who is our co chair and at Bio Alberta and co founder of Sinovita, and she will walk you through and introduce you to the next uh, portion of Alberta's vaccine journey and John uh, Lewis from Entos. So uh, take a couple minutes break. We'll see you back here at 1230. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>